On this episode of True North, we set sail with a team of scientists studying warming in the polar oceans. This is a region that has seen tremendous ice loss in the last decades. And things get a little rocky. Hold on a second, I'm actually feeling a little bit sick. One of the main subjects that brought us to the Arctic was sea ice retreat. Satellite images show that sea ice is melting at an alarming rate, about 16,000 square miles a year since 1979, providing a stark visualization of the region's rapidly changing climate. Nearly every year marks a new low for maximum sea ice extent. We wanted to find out why, so we were joining one of the Norwegian Polar Institute's scientific research missions high in the Arctic Ocean. So this is actually the ship that we're going to be on in not too much longer, the RV Lanza. This is not too many years ago when it was stuck uh, in the moving Arctic ice for six months. Our experience is going to be a little bit different, but it's cool to be able to look at the ship and know that this is going to be home very soon. Before we boarded the boat, we wanted some background on NPI. I'm uh, Ivar. I am the main librarian at the Norwegian Polar Institute. The mission, one could say, is to help the authorities take care of our polar areas and keep Svalbard as the best preserved polar wilderness in the world. From the 70s on, the environmental issues have become more and more important. With stations in Longyearbyen and Nialesund and multiple missions into the polar oceans each year, NPI is home to some of the world's foremost authorities on polar science. My name is Adam Sundfjord, I'm a physical oceanographer with the Norwegian Polar Institute and I'll be leading the expedition. The A-Twin project is focusing on the Atlantic water inflow just north of Svalbard. It's a big branch of water that originates in the Gulf of Mexico. This is the largest heat source into the Arctic Ocean. It's a region that has seen tremendous ice loss in the last decades. The Atlantic water inflow is a key factor in the rapid changes the Arctic is undergoing. I am Emily Meyer. As a physical oceanographer, my role is to look at how the ocean affects that sea ice. The ocean takes up most of the heat increase on the whole planet, so the oceans are warming up globally, and the warm water that comes in from the Atlantic is warm enough to melt the sea ice from below. Usually that cold water insulates the warm water from the sea ice. But in more recent time, this water has been warming up and getting bigger in volume, and that has the potential to melt more sea ice. So what we're actually doing here is covering, through various measurements, the volume and heat content of this Atlantic water. What we think is that when the oceanic heat coming in here works together with the warming atmosphere, we'll probably see much greater ice loss in the future in larger areas of the Arctic Ocean. This big ice loss will alter the total reflectivity of the planet. More solar heat will be absorbed and this process is likely to accelerate even more. This will have effects on the planet as a whole because you add more heat to the Earth, it's going to get warmer. We were headed into extreme weather, so we needed some extreme gear. And these are the suits. If it's cold, it'll keep you warm. Like I've worked in this down to minus 40. The other types are survival suits. If you fall in the water with these, they will keep you alive for a few hours. Somebody punch me. <laughs> I feel like I could dip my hands in magma in these. This goes just on your nose. I'm an Arctic ninja. We're just about to board the Lanza. It's exciting. It's 13 days out uh, on the open ocean, disconnected from the world. Let's hop on board. A cruise like this is totally dependent on the people. Of course, we need to have the key backgrounds. 
the instrument engineers, we need the mooring technicians, biological sampling, we need the people with competence on ship-mounted instrumentations. We have a pretty diverse crew. We're passing by a low-lying island, a nature preserve that's home to a number of walruses, both uh, sunning themselves on the beach and also swimming right by the shore. The first day was just sailing, so we wanted to get to know the team before the research started. So what do you have planned for us? Well, for this a cruise, we will be leaving from Longyearbyen, heading north along the west coast of Svalbard, and then we'll head just about as far east as this map goes. We have three moorings out there. We'll head back westwards, deploy another two moorings, then we head down here for another shelf mooring, then we head westwards again. There's an underwater plateau here. And so we basically have multiple lines where the same band of water that you want to get more information about is going to pass through multiple points. Yeah. We're really covering a lot of ground. We are indeed. It's very difficult traveling in the Arctic because of the ice. There are not that many vessels capable of going here. It's a short time window that it is ice free here, so you don't necessarily know beforehand when it's going to open up. You can have very bad weather, storms, big waves, ice pressure that crashes your boat. Typically between zero and a few cruises go up here and that's supposed to cover all fields of marine science. Nelson was also the first to explain the interaction between the warm Atlantic water and the cold polar ocean. And that's the same phenomena that scientists are still working with. We started the A-Twain project back in 2012, and altogether we deployed nine moorings. One was lost that year, and the other eight were successfully recovered. And then we've had cruises in 2013, recovering those first moorings. Uh, again in 14, but the area was full of ice, so we couldn't get here. Uh, 2015, we went back, and luckily everything had survived. And since then, we decided we'll go every second year. What's interesting with the Arctic is that it's not a continent, there's no land, there's just ice that's floating at the surface of the ocean. The Arctic sea ice is on average only two and a half meter thick, but it's really vast. And it's not a solid piece just in one bit, it's fractured all over. It moves around with the wind and storms, so it's a really difficult place to come and collect data. Because of that, we don't have that much data in the Arctic, in particular in the winter. It's also very hard to study the ocean under the sea ice. And so we use the summertime when the ice melts to go and collect data. So this is it right here. Got a post-it note and everything. Huh. Well, it, uh, that's the tour. <laughs> <laughs> it's tight, but honestly, on a ship this size, having any kind of privacy is, uh, is a luxury. A lot of people are two to a room, so it's nice to have even a little bit of space to retreat to. It's about half the size of my apartment at home. <laughs> my name is Elizabeth. I work on board as a stewardess. Living at sea is uh, it's quite different. You have to tolerate a lot. <laughs> but it's really great. To familiarize ourselves with our new home, we took a tour with Tom, our first mate. So what are we starting with? We're starting with the engine room. It's quite noisy down there. A little bit, yeah. This is uh, the control room for the engine. They have all the alarms. It's like a spaceship, jeez. And here we have the steering engine. Okay. Imagine the size of the thing you turn with that. It's bigger than the ones at Ikea. I don't know about you, but I can feel the swells now. You should be able to handle a little bit of sea, because it makes everything harder. The sea can suddenly just, oh, bad weather. This is the lapse. And this is where the ABs have all the equipment. The ABs? Yeah, the able seaman. And an old boat like this have a lot of spare parts. We have almost everything. And this is up towards uh, the very front of the ship now, right? Yeah. So this is quite noisy when you are going into in the ice. Mm -hmm. Indeed it is. Hitting it? Yeah. Just wait and see. Yeah? You think so? <laughs> yeah. We've seen so little ice so far. Yeah, but uh, we are going to 80 degrees north, so I probably think that we will end up in the ice. And just like with the toilets, the stairs are more interesting when the ship is bobbing up and down by like a couple meters. <laughs> Cute bear.
This is the bridge. Captain is there. He runs the boat. This is uh, the radio room where all the communication is uh, going out. Ooh. And we even have an ice machine. Oh, I didn't realize that's what that was. <laughs> Hold on a second. Uh, I'm actually feeling a little bit sick. Yeah, I think I might stop. I'm gonna go to the bathroom, just in case. Yeah. Let's go film it. So it finally caught up with me. I decided to go off the medication to try to get a little bit of energy back because it was exhausting me. Um, but it turned out it was also treating seasickness though. Outside, the storm was picking up. It's a good one coming up. Crackers, they settle in your stomach, cool. ginger tablets, they calm your nerves, yes. or jam. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing with citrus. Nothing with citrus. That will kill him. <laughs> <laughs> I feel so sorry for him. So we call jam <laughs> our sickle, because <laughs> he's been ill the entire time. What's the problem with cycling? Yeah, what? you? I'm sickle. <laughs> I think he's gonna kiss the ground when he finds it. That was intense. But even in rough seas, the scientists were eager to work. What we have here is our lightweight, uh, on the go, on the fly uh, turbulence measurement kit. It consists of this wonderful instrument here. It's a free-falling probe that we can deploy from the big ship, or from a small vessel, or from drifting sea ice. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And at the tip of the instrument, it has these tiny little sensors that will measure the vertical velocity in the water. This tells us about the really micro motions in the ocean, so we can talk about how the water is mixed, how fast heat is being transmitted, and how fast nutrients can be transmitted from uh, the deep reservoirs towards the surface where the plankton grow. So it's an essential tool in the studies that we're doing. But, uh, <laughs> that should go us. <laughs> it works. So we only need this tiny little kit to do the most fabulous measurements. Yay. And some hard-working oceanographers to lift it up. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> but as it looks now, we're not going out tonight. It's getting a bit rough. So we'll save that for another day. The research would have to wait. as it is, I do want to get to the bridge, because at least then I can see the water, but even getting there is a little bit difficult with waves like this. Oh, God. So it's been a little bit of a rough day um, for me, but apparently for a lot of other people too. Um, the wind really picked up and so we got a lot more waves, which exacerbated the, like, the bucking back and forth of the ship. You have the normal side to side, and so the issue isn't just the intensity, but also that it's entirely unpredictable. Your body never gets used to it because it keeps changing. There's a thing where they say that up here it's uh, wilder because it's higher and everything, but down below it's more subtle movement. But I don't know, I've laid down there and it really did not feel subtle to me. Ooh. 
<laughs> a little, little bit of motion right now. Oh, I'm glad the waves got going right before food. Perfect timing. A day had passed, and the storm showed no signs of stopping. So we headed to the evening meeting to hear the revised plan. Welcome to tonight's meeting. The uh, summary of the day will be quite brief. We've been uh, riding the waves, waiting for better times. So before getting on the boat, uh, I had never really been on a ship for more than a couple of hours at a time, and so I didn't really have any idea how seasickness would affect me. The waves just kept picking up and the wind was increasing, so we decided to go into uh, Duvefjorden for shelter so that uh, work is easier. It's going to pick up again tomorrow and through the night. So it looks like we won't be deploying anything Simple things like maneuvering around the ship are incredibly difficult, but there's a lot of work to be done. Are we doing any CTDs um, in the meantime? Or? If it's as rough as it was today, no. So we need to make a plan for movies and science papers, I think. We were a few days into our journey with NPI's scientists, collecting data that would help to both monitor and understand sea ice melt in the Arctic's oceans. It's Saturday night, and we're steaming further east and north than many have been before. We were headed to recover a set of moorings left during the previous A Twain mission in 2015. The main tools are uh, oceanographic moorings. Um, those are bottom-mounted instrument chains that we deploy from the ship. We leave them out there for typically one or two years. The only way scientists can understand climate change and make accurate predictions is to have multiple measurements taken over a long span of time. These collections are called time series. We are very short of long time series in the interior Arctic Ocean, so the A20 project is one of the longer and more comprehensive time series that I think will be very useful in changing times as we are in now. The moorings track data year-round, even under the ice, and these long-term measurements allow scientists to say with more certainty what is climate change and what is natural variability. My name is Angelika Renner. I'm a physical oceanographer and CS physicist. So this is just as a reminder what sort of moorings we're looking at. This was from the original deployment in 2012, where we have the three moorings at 200 meters, 500 and 800, trying to capture this beautifully visualized Atlantic water inflow in that region. When I first went out to measure sea ice in 2005, there was a lot of ice, like four or five meters thick or even thicker. When I went out in Fram Strait in 2012, there was no four meter ice. The only ice we found was a meter maybe. So suddenly we were looking for the thickest ice we could find so that we could actually work on it without falling through. And that has been a dramatic change. You could still think that maybe it was just variability. But I also analyzed the data in that region that showed exactly the same, it just went down. That's the first year of data from that 800 meter mooring, around about 200 meters, and that's the core of the Atlantic water inflow. We should be reaching the area where we want to find the first mooring that has been out for two years now, at around 8.30. The recovery operation will be led by Kisten. So this particular mooring is sitting at 200 meters near the shelf break. It connects the Atlantic water inflow that we capture with the deeper moorings and it tells us what the connection is between the inflow and the shelf where most of the biological production is. So it's an important mooring. So right now they're trying to track down the location of the first mooring. They think that they're in the rough area. They're not sure yet though, so fingers crossed. The first thing we did was to try to locate the mooring on the echo sounder. We should see it as a standing structure in the water column. So this echo sounder is sending an acoustic signal down, so it tells us how deep it is. In theory, if there's anything in the way for that beam, it should reflect back. However, <laughs> the mooring is tiny compared to the footprint of that signal, so you really have to hit it exactly. The first thing to hope for is to find it at all. Uh, several things could go wrong here. Uh, the most likely cause of uh, mooring loss would be uh, trawlers that could either cut the line for the mooring or actually grab the whole thing and break it. We did not find that on the echo sounder. So what we're doing now is to try to inquire via the back unit of the acoustic release that is down there to see if we get a signal from it at all. The acoustic release helps us recovering the moorings. I'm just going to give it a command here to arm it. You can hear the ticking sound. So now it's ready and when I'm giving the, the 
go command, it should release the hook and you can see the anchor is dropping and then the mooring will float up. Did you hear the sound of it? It's like a bird almost. And we actually have contact. So we're closer to the release. We still don't know if it's standing upright or if it's just the release left. So we'll have to keep searching a bit. Second biggest danger is sea ice. When ice flows crash together, they will stand upright and they can form keels that are more than 20 meters deep. I have to say there's one line before that. Was it on the inclination, like a... No. Third is simple mooring failure. You can have corrosion on your integral mooring parts. Batteries being drained or the internal electronics fail. So from the deck unit we get contact and we know the distance from the ship and where the mooring is supposed to be, but we don't know the direction. And so we write down our position and note the distance. Then we're going to go to another position and then we're going to go to a third point and then we triangulate the distances and then hopefully we find the mooring positions. Yes! Yep, no error. I think we have it on the echo sounder now. ADCP. We got it. Yes. So what we see here is the uh, buoyancy just above the bottom uh, release. And then higher up in the water column is another group of uh, buoyancy spheres. We have a mooring that is standing up in the water. So we should be getting something up tomorrow. Yay! Does anybody want to know what the revised cruise plan for the night is? Yes. yes. It's Saturday evening. Let's, uh, let's call it a night, people. <laughs> <laughs> really, really good. <laughs> Relief. So the mooring is 243 meters away from us. Um, the ocean is 200 meters deep here. We think we're in a great position and uh, ready to go. Okay, Kristen, perfect position. Okay, it has been released. It should be uh, on its way up. Well, not this long, so it seems it hasn't released. We know that the mooring is there and uh, the release command has been sent and accepted, so for some reason the hook hasn't let the mooring go yet. We're going to have to do a manual recovery, which involves pulling a line and a hook around it and dragging it up. I wasn't really uh, ready for this. We're going to have to spool up steel wire and then put a decent weight at the end of that and the circle around the mooring and tighten and, uh, and see if it comes up that way. It's been 20 years since the last time we did it and uh, the record is Kisten 100 and uh, mooring zero. He has never had to leave one behind, so that's a lot of pressure on your shoulders, Kisten. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the last option is to lower the cruise leader <laughs> yes. down with a knife. <laughs> So we've done a full loop around the mooring now. We'll start pulling it back in and see if we have any catch. We have a mooring. All right, this is good. That's really thumbs up. Like everything else that spends a year or two in the Arctic, it's grown a beard. Kirsten, go to your butt. Bit of what? Yay! The guided tour of the mooring. The instrument is a CTD, so it records temperature and salinity uh, and depth. That's our key instrument, so we have these spread out at different depths in the water column. So this guy is a current meter. We process data from all four beams at the same time to get a 3D picture of the currents in the whole water column. Nice instrument, always works, great stuff. <laughs> and this is the acoustic release that we were speaking with, so we knew it was there, but it wouldn't release, possibly due to all the growth. Is this just for buoyancy? Yes, we have one in the middle at uh, 120 meters or so, and then one at the very surface. And so can a lot of this equipment be reused once the data is taken off of it? Yeah, essentially we reuse everything except for this uh, Kevlar rope that holds it together. I'm sure the scientists have got to be eager to crack those things open.
so this morning, the first mooring was recovered, although there were complications. The second one is being searched for right now, and we're hoping this goes a bit more by the book. Well, he's trying to establish contact with the acoustic release. We'll know pretty soon if uh, there is something alive down there listening to us, and uh, it should tell us how far away it is. So. No response so far. If it isn't one thing, it's another. What happened now? Uh, the releaser doesn't respond. I'm just trying to figure out how best to help us find those middle moorings. That's the one I really, really want. So it's really the one that gives us most information about the core of this Atlantic water and flow. Hey. Still no contact with the bottom release. Seems to be a bad omen. Every time I change the cruise plan, I have to change it again. So I should stop doing that. It's not looking so good for the second mooring today. We've done a quite extensive search around the recovery area. So I think we've done what we can for now. We'll be heading towards the next mooring position to make sure at least we recover one mooring while it's still daylight. So, a bit disappointing uh, after an interesting start earlier today. Okay. Oh, God. <laughs> so, what are you guys doing right now? Now we're doing the final prep of this ADCP instrument we're using the Doppler effect. It sends out a sound signal, and this sound signal propagates as a wave upwards in the water column. And because there's a lot of particles and air bubbles in the water, some of these sound waves, they uh, reflect and come back to your instrument. The frequency of the reflected signal is different because of the velocity of these particles. So from that frequency chain, we can calculate exactly the velocity of the water. It's pretty amazing, just off of tiny little particles. And this one's also got a vertical beam to measure ice thickness and also the ice drift speed and direction. And uh, where this is going to be deployed, is that ice covered for a good portion of the year? Hopefully, yes. <laughs> that, that, that's the idea. Have uh, instruments specifically like this for tracking the, the ice thickness, have those been deployed on moorings previously? Some, but not many. Not many, yes. okay. And we don't have good time series. So hopefully this will contribute to that. So we're now at the third mooring location and finally things are working uh, as they should <laughs> from the beginning. Uh, we can see a signal on the echo sound rip. It's there, yay! <laughs> they have interrogated the acoustic release at the bottom. It responded immediately, so we are now preparing for release and recovery. You are ready to go? Okay, the clock so it's great, so I'm ready. Yay, go! Could it come up either side? <laughs> Okay, we got it. Excellent. So this is how it's supposed to work every time. So this third boring we're picking up now has also been out for two years. That has survived about 10 months of ice cover in the first year and almost 11 months of ice cover now in the second year. This one has a crawler on it. In addition, there's a standard CTD sound, a current meter at the bottom. This is a really cool mooring, and we're happy to get it back. Agnieszka, have you seen your baby yet? Our colleague Agnieszka, she didn't have time to worry about whether we'd get it back or not. <laughs> I can see that she uh, smiles all over now. That's really good. Yeah? Hello. Two of three, or better than one of three. From the instruments which we recovered, we are very happy because all of the instruments actually deliver data as planned or nearly as planned. At the moment I'm, I'm working on this McLean Mort profiler. It's a very interesting instrument. Little change in buoyancy makes it going up and down twice a day and measures 900 meters thick water column, collecting data every few centimeters. The one which we just recovered collected more than 1,000 profiles. Okay. So it's really a lot wow. of data. So now it's testing different sensors which are on the profiler. And when everything is correct, then I can program it for deployment. This is supposed to go out in the next 24 hours? Yes. 
and uh, we're still wondering what the wind is going to be like. Because this is heavy moving and quite densely instrumented, this will be deployed anchor first, so that means that the whole thing is hanging on the crane until we put it on the bottom. And this can be dangerous. If there are high waves, if the sea is rough, then everything will be moving a lot. And it's risk for people working on the mooring, but also for instruments themselves. Oh, wow. You can see there over on the railing that they're like incrementally adding on the extra sections. But you notice they have to deal with the fact that the boat is bucking up and down by three or four meters. And if you're not careful, whatever tool you're putting on can be dashed against the side of the boat. So in the past couple of days, it's actually gotten cold enough that some of the water that's been splashing on has been freezing on the deck. A lot of these scientists are spending almost all of their time with bare hands in absolutely freezing conditions. I mean, I'm wearing these and my hands aren't hot, but they're still a little bit cold. That's the noise that cables make in movies right before they snap. So that's another mooring uh, fully in the ocean. And now we play the waiting game to find out what data it's going to be able to gather over the course of two years. We were a few days into our journey with NPI's scientists tracking the warm Atlantic water that comes into the Arctic and its effects on the region's disappearing sea ice. Tonight we'll be doing a CTD transect, so we go north a bit to 3,000 meter depth and we'll do 10, 11 CTD stations starting then at 3,000 meters and going up on the shelf. We'll be starting around 9 o'clock, so we should finish sometime in the morning. Today we were joining more of an anomaly to learn about some of the ship-mounted instruments. So, what are you working on? We're now in the CTD control room. My name is Morven. I'm a polar oceanographer. I work with the ocean currents and ocean temperatures and sea ice. A CTD, that stands for conductivity temperature depth. From conductivity, we can calculate the salinity. Together, salinity and temperature are the most important variables uh, when we study the physics of the ocean because they determine the density. So with just those measurements, you can actually say quite a bit about the water as you go through it. Yeah, warmer water tends to be lighter and more salt, it makes it denser. So now that it's been down, you're, you're re-prepping all the different pieces. What's required for that? Now we need to open all these bottles, called Niskin bottles. So they've got a valve at the top and at the bottom, and there's a spring in between. Now it's open and the water can flow through. Yeah. So as soon as I click the button inside, this will release this okay. and it will shut. If the bottle would close on its way down, then the pressure will be too big and the bottle will implode. This top part sends all the data through the wire. It looks like just an old wire. <laughs> it doesn't look like it'd be carrying all that information. This is a surprisingly complicated wire. <laughs> The further north you go into the Arctic Ocean, the less observations you get. Because of the sea ice, it's been really difficult to get there. It's a very harsh environment, so the few observations you have, they're very valuable. We're working with an environment that's changing fast. We're trying to understand what is natural, what is not. Every year up here has been different. As the CTD rises through the water column, it sends both real-time temperature data and takes samples of water at different depths. So now we're at 100 meters, so she fires one bottle. Change in the Arctic is definitely happening faster now than it's happened before, and we see that the changes are bigger than they are elsewhere on the planet. For my studies, I look at all CTD stations in this whole area for the past 100 years. Polar explorer Friedhof Nansen, with an early version of this device, was the first scientist to take samples in the Arctic Ocean. This is a Nansen bottle. He developed this instrument to take up samples. He brought this on the farm expedition. But when he came back, there was a very important development of the accuracy of this technology and he felt so bad that he didn't have good enough equipment. So for the rest of his life, he hoped that someone would go back to the polar ocean and take new samples. Back up to the surface. We're here in these nice warm suits now, and, and we're only here for two weeks. But just imagining that, you know, more than a hundred years before people like Nansen and the other explorers, they were doing observations and they were out here for years at a time frozen into the ice, 
And they were also collecting data, trying to understand how the system works back then. And then nobody knew anything. It was during those voyages that they learned that there was no land around the North Pole because nobody had been there before. I find it really inspiring. So doing this a whole night uh, takes a bit of patience. At the surface it was at minus one degree, so the water was close to freezing. And as it goes down at about 90 meters it's warm-ish, it's three degrees, and then it starts to cool down again. We have this curve which shows the temperature of the water as we go down. At the surface it's cold, in the middle it's warm, and the bottom it's cold. And that warm middle bit we call that Atlantic water, and this is what we're studying. And below it we have deep Arctic water, and at the surface we have polar waters. So we're going to do a lot of these profiles. By the end of the cruise we can draw several of these plots, and we're going to have a lot of this curve showing us what the Atlantic water is like in different places. Sometimes it's zigzag, sometimes it's a bit warmer, sometimes it's a bit cooler, sometimes it's a bit deeper. And by the end of the cruise we can take them all and it gives us the mean temperature profile for this year in this region. But we've been here before, in 2015, and we had a different curve. And we were there two years before and maybe it looked like this. So what we see is that each year the depth of this Atlantic water changes slightly and how warm it is as well. And if we put together all the years, we start having a trend. In 2012, it was quite deep, and then it got a little shallower, and then a little shallower, a little shallower, closer to the surface. And then you draw a line and you realize, oh, maybe there's a linear change in how deep this Atlantic water is. And if you do this long enough, then you can say at the end, the Atlantic water has been getting shallower by X number. I'm not giving you the answer because we haven't finished um, doing this yet. We still have to come back many, many years to be able to look for a trend. But this is where we're going with this kind of data. And why is that important, you're going to ask? The heat from this water right now doesn't make it to the ice because it's insulated by this cold water layer. So it's not melting the ice. But if you make this warm water go closer to the surface, we end up with transfers of heat all the way to the surface, melting the ice at the top. This is why we really want to know what's happening to this warm water. This is central Arctic condition. And on the shelf, it's slightly different because we're closer to the entrance of the warm Atlantic water. And there is so much warm water, so shallow here, that the heat from this warm water makes it to the top and melts the ice. And this is why right now we have no ice outside. We were 12 down and 80 CTD profiles left to go, so we headed to the next research point. Working on science in the Arctic is really exciting, but at the same time it's a little frightening because it's changing so fast and impacts for society are very large and important. The atmosphere warming up plays just as much, if not a bigger role. It's only a small part of the bigger picture of what's happening in the Arctic right now. You make a difference with the work you do. But at the same time, it's a little scary sometimes. You're right there when all this science is being made and you kind of understand what's going on. You kind of wish sometimes you didn't know how bad it is. It feels like a bit of a responsibility. So everyone's on the edge of their seat to find out if we're actually going to meet some ice finally. Here we go, here's our new satellite image. So I put in the positions of the last CTD transect we did, and this is the open ocean. And then here we see the ice edge. So long story short, we're probably not going to run into much ice anytime soon. Nope. Which is probably going to make the captain very happy, and it's going to make the mooring people very happy, because it makes all that so much easier. But not necessarily the scientists in love with ice. No, yeah. not really. <laughs> So the ice so far is looking very absent. <laughs> so the image from yesterday shows that the ice edge is north of 82 north. Now that could change obviously. We are out here for almost two weeks, so we just need a change in the wind. That would be great. Sea ice isn't the only thing in the Arctic affected by rising temperatures. The animals are feeling the heat as well. So we met up with Sigrid, the team's biologist, to learn more. My name is uh, Sigrid Egaran. I work with the biological sampling. You've been in here quite a bit over the past few days. Yeah, this is my place uh, during the cruises. So I take the water samples in specific depths all the way down to the seafloor. 
these measurements are a measure of the productivity, the living plant material in the sea. And we look for differences between the years, comparing the warm and the cold water. The more warm water masses coming up, it can uh, change the system. When these temperature changes happen, it's a much bigger change to go from minus one degree Celsius to plus one degree Celsius, because it, that's the area where you have the freezing point. So it's a very much bigger habitat change than any other place on the temperature scale. Are you seeing any effect as uh, global warming continues? It's really difficult to say something in this stage of time, because uh, this science, it takes a lot of time and a lot of replicates and many, many years to see changes. We were here in 2012, uh, just when uh, the ice uh, disappeared. So we have been taking samples 2012, 2013, 2015 and now 2017. It's really important to have a long series. We hope that we will see the changes. It's really important with this kind of work that you do the same thing every time and be very accurate. This is a filtration unit. So what I do, I use this uh, vacuum pump that uh, sucks the water through the filter. And the filters have different pore size and they are treated differently. It's a clever little tool. This is for chlorophyll A totally. This is for chlorophyll bigger than 10 microns. And on this one I have the particulate organic carbon. It's like a bartender. These are burn filters to get rid of all the carbon that's in it. And that's also why I'm wearing this lab coat and gloves. I'm not working with chemicals but it's to protect my QC samples from organic uh, stuff. Okay, so it's not about protecting you, it's about protecting them. Yeah. <laughs> when all the water is gone through, we rinse it with filtered seawater, and we fold the filter, and we put them in uh, aluminum foil, and we freeze them. And I bring the filters home to Tromsø, where we analyze them. I also work with zooplankton. Since plankton is the lowest part in the nutrient chain, it's really important. This sample from this particular station, we found uh, the most common species, colonus, which operates mostly in Atlantic warm water. Mm -hmm. And we also found colonus glacialis, which is slightly bigger, and the colonus hyperboreus, which is the biggest one. And they have this long antenna. Oh yeah, you can't actually see them with the naked eye. Some of them have been transported from the warmer water masses and some of them are living there as their main area. We have seen quite big change in the zooplankton. The smaller zooplankton from the south has increased in numbers, whereas some of the large zooplankton in the north have decreased. So there's a takeover from other compartments of the ecosystem. When new species are arriving, it connects more compartments of the ecosystem that has not been connected before. And this makes the system perhaps also more vulnerable to other kind of stressors. We do expect that there will be an energy source change from the bottom to the zooplankton. And that may favor other species and the Arctic fish community will be the losers. We know how the measurements we're gathering are being used to understand the changing Arctic but we wanted to understand how they contribute to the bigger conversation about global climate change. So we sat down with Morvin to discuss climate modeling. When we do these CTD profiles, we get a great snapshot of the oceanographic conditions at a given location at a given time. When we set out one of these moorings, we have a lot of information about the conditions in water over a year or two at a given location. However, in both these methods of observing the ocean, there's a lot of gaps. Yeah. We use models to try to fill up the gaps. I work with uh, a global climate model, and it builds on the idea that if you know all the equations that governs the whole physical system and you know all the parameters at a certain time, then you could theoretically calculate your way to the next step in time towards a prediction. Yeah. We have the Earth and we've divided it in all these small boxes, about 140,000 that cover the whole planet and 70 different depth levels. And I have that for all the parameters, say 20. Because there's a huge amount of data that goes into these models. You kind of have to go on a rough resolution because we just don't have computers yet okay. so that can do It would that. take a long time to actually to run it. It doesn't only take a long time, it's still not possible. Oh, okay. I run it for a 140 year period. So that takes uh, about three weeks time oh, wow. on a supercomputer, mm -hmm. which has 60,000 processors. Oh, wow. 
I bet I could run some games really well. <laughs> <laughs> Very well. <laughs> So I'm only saving monthly averages. I still end up having eight terabytes of data. Oh. That's no pictures or anything, wow. that's just numbers. Yeah. <laughs> so how well do they work? Um, <laughs> so, uh, some of them are very good. There is lots of variability, and we know that. But it has been documented that over the recent years, Atlantic water temperatures have increased, and it has also become shallower. So the models get this as well. So the sort of work that we've been doing on this particular expedition, how is that contributing to improving the model? The more observations, the, the better we can see, okay, how well does the model behave? Mm -hmm. So you're making your uncertainty smaller. So I use this information, I feed it into our global model, I run the model for a time period that has already been, see how well does the model compared to the observations, as well as we might learn more about processes that then can be adapted into the model's actual calculations. So the equations get more and more accurate and the observations help for that. So are those sorts of expeditions going on distributed across the globe? Yes, oh. it's a global effort. All the data is being published and used in these models. And there's a handful of models like this around the world. And they're all slightly different, which is good. They have their specialities, and all together you can compare all these models again. Then you get even smaller uncertainty because you have different approaches. And it's models like these that are being used, uh, for example, by the IPCC, making reports about climate change. And hopefully with more information and more model studies, we have a better understanding of how this all works and changes. At 82 degrees north, we finally hit the ice. The a -Twain project is on a good path for continuation. We have shown in the first five years that the data is extremely useful, and now different projects, not only from Norway, but internationally, are building their projects around this. We work in an area that is changing. When I go to sea and collect data, I don't reflect so much upon it. And when I analyze my data, I think I do that objectively. It's more on a personal level that I feel the change and have emotions about the change. This is a map of where we are right now. The ship is coming in here in red. The glacier is retreating faster than this map is updated. It's so easy to see how the glaciers have been shrinking. Uh, some variability is natural, but now it's just overall big retreats and it's very visual. We used to do lots of work on sea ice in the fjords, now there's virtually none left. It's more those sort of overall personal reflections that are emotional. I'm sad about climate changing here in this area. Listen to this. You hear the ice? It's like it's alive. The best thing of a scientific cruise is, of course, the data. We're all worried if you get to do everything you're planned. If all the moorings are deployed or we actually get to do all the observations we plan to do, but it all worked out. You end up being like a small family on board for a couple of weeks. You get to know each other really well. It's been a great trip with great people. We are all here to do a job, but that's not all. We are also here because we are really into it. You wouldn't become a field-going polar scientist if you wouldn't love this, because otherwise you wouldn't put up with the sleep deprivation or with the freezing cold hands all the time or the being seasick all the time. It was so beautiful. So happy that yeah. we saw some. Yeah. Brilliant. It's weird that it's taken until almost the end of our journey to finally feel like we're actually in the Arctic as opposed to some other ocean that you can look out and see almost endless ice. It's quiet and it's cold. And I know that they have a different way of looking at it, the scientists, because they have much more experience, but it does worry me that, that we could go as far as we've gone, as north as we've gone, and still not see ice until right now. It is beautiful. <laughs>